Hello everyone, welcome to the Lightning Ball channel. If you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please do so and activate the notification bell. Your support fuels my continued efforts. In our previous episode, we discussed the fifth battle of the Eight Gate Formation, where Primordial Yellow Carrera faced off against the Empire's number one Imperial Guardian, Tatsuya Kanda. With Seal's assistance, Carrera successfully awakened her ultimate skill, Lord of Destruction, ultimately securing a narrow victory. Following that, Carrera and Tatsuya Kanda made a pact, integrating Lord of Judgment into Lord of Destruction for further evolution. This episode shifts focus to other battlefields, detailing the actions of Primordial White Testarossa, Primordial Black Diablo, and other Remuras subordinates. Let's get started. While Primordial Purple Ultima and Primordial Carrera were engaged in battles against the Empire's top two, Damrata and Tatsuya Kandu, the last two challengers of the Eight Gate Formation, Benimaru and Demon Pier Veyron, also secured victories. With Seal's assistance, Benimaru awakened his ultimate skill, Lord of Shimmering Flame, Amaterasu. This power was revealed by Seal after analyzing the ultimate abilities of Scorched Dragon Velgrind. It's worth noting that Benimaru, after learning about ultimate skills, longed for and worked towards acquiring such a power, indeed nearing its attainment. However, Seal helped Benimaru gain his ultimate skill more swiftly, making adjustments and enhancements significantly. As for the name Amaterasu, it could be understood as a stream of heat, an invisible and intangible phenomenon immune to attack, representing the pinnacle of stealth magic. It can also be interpreted as the sun's light, possessing the heat to burn everything. Encased in the black flames, Benimaru's Odachi, Red Lotus, effortlessly incinerated his opponent, the Empire's third-ranked granite, turning him to ash. On the other hand, Demon Pier Veyron obtained the ultimate gift, Artist, using this ultimate power to perfectly execute his demonic deeds. He meticulously dismembered Marco, a formidable opponent Veyron found challenging to deal with previously on the battlefield of the Dwargan Nation, starting with the arms, then the tongue, slowly tormenting the Empire's elite from head to toe. Thus, seven gates of the eight-gate formation were breached but those outside remained unaware of the events that transpired within the gates. Shifting the focus outside, Velgrind was anxious because her parallel existence had been devoured by demon Lord Remuru without any response, causing her to lose most of her energy. Coupled with the magicule spent in earlier battles, the Velgrind's parallel existence remaining beside Rudra had only 20% of her magicule capacity left, making it clear she could not defeat Remuru in this state. Realizing this, Velgrind decided to abandon guarding the gates and focus instead on ensuring Rudra's safety. However, at that moment, a voice mocking Velgrind for her panic was heard. It was Primordial White, Testarossa. Testarossa, assuming the pose of a ruler, elegantly enjoyed her tea, which visibly irritated Velgrind. On a side note, you might wonder why there was tea, tables and chairs on the battlefield. This was the work of Ultima's subordinate Zonda whose service in this aspect could rival Shunna's. Returning to the battlefield, Testarossa once again reminded Velgrind that she now had the wonderful name Testarossa and asked not to be endlessly called her primordial white, implying perhaps Velgrind was deliberately provoking her. Velgrind, somewhat speechless, acknowledged that even with only 20% of her magicule capacity, she had previously managed to overwhelmingly suppress Testarossa, Ultima, and Carrera with just 10% of her capacity in the Dwargan nation. The disparity between them could not be accurately described as overwhelming. However, Testarossa remained unyielding, knowing her goal wasn't to win. Against Velgrind, Testarossa only needed to buy time. Saying so, Testarossa effortlessly dodged Velgrind's punch, and the resulting shockwave shattered the nearby chairs and tables. While lacking the means to defeat Velgrind made victory difficult, Merely stalling for time was well within Testarossa's capabilities given her current strength. Testarossa sensed that the challenges within the eight-gate formation were being successfully overcome one after another, and her comrades would soon join the fight. Most importantly, Rimura-sama was also on his way. The battle between Rimuru and the two true dragons filled Testarossa with delight. She savored the thought of Rimura-sama playing Velgrind like a child revealing all of Velgrind's hidden techniques during their fight. 
Therefore, Testarossa would take advantage of this opportunity. The two became interwoven beams of red and white light, with Veldrind launching fierce attacks that would incinerate anything they touched. On the other hand, Testarossa remained composed, dodging attacks with minimal movement and then counterattacking with a sidekick, forcing Veldrind to maintain distance. They were like two extremes, one aggressive and the other elegant, yet despite their close engagement, either could land a hit on the other. After several rounds, Veldrind grew puzzled, wondering why she, who had easily overpowered Primordial White in recent battles, now couldn't even touch the Primordial White. Testarossa also expressed her astonishment, revealing that she had just now acquired an ultimate skill, thus achieving a higher understanding of power utilization. She had wished for new strength just moments ago, and her heartfelt desire had materialized into form. Although she thought she heard an incredible voice then, Testarossa firmly believed the power was gained through her instincts. This ultimate skill, Lord of Underworld, much like Luminous' ultimate skill, Lord of Lust, governed over life and death, albeit with a greater emphasis on death. Moreover, the Lord of the Underworld included a rare world system magic called Afterworld. Other world system magics included Zijin's Fantasy World, Ultima's Death World, and Diablo's Temptation World. With the augmentation of her ultimate skill, Testarossa was able to dodge Velgrind's attacks flawlessly. Velgrind, annoyed by Testarossa's arrogant demeanor, was enraged further. However, as she prepared to launch another assault, a massive explosion occurred beside them, and one of the gates was spectacularly blown away. A battered but spirited golden-haired demon emerged. It was Carrera. Testarossa inquired about her condition, to which Carrera replied that Tatsuya Kondo was incredibly strong. Still, she was satisfied with the battle's outcome and opted out of Testarossa's fight for the day, then sat down to watch the battle with assistance from her subordinates. Another voice then declared its intent to observe and learn seriously. Given Carrera's restraint, it was Ultima, emerging from another gate. The subsequent arrival of demons brought good news, yet the situation was far from over. Benimaru, Xi'an, and Suyue also appeared, stepping out from the gates. Velgrind finally realized something. Testarossa's plan had succeeded, and her and Rudra's desires were about to be thwarted. Rewind the clock a bit. A little while before Benimaru and the others were planning their assault on the airship, Diablo disclosed that due to noticing a little rat within the Empire's ranks, he decided to stay by Rimura's side. His mission was to protect Rimuru and ensure no one interfered with Rimuru's endeavor to free Storm Dragon Veldora. Consequently, Benimaru and his team agreed to let Diablo operate alone. This arrangement thrilled Diablo, who found joy in the plan's success. Being close to observing Rimura-sama's combat while identifying and compensating for Rimura-sama's shortcomings allowed him to serve his master more effectively. Diablo chuckled to himself, then quickly corrected his thought. How could Rimura-sama have weaknesses? Diablo then pondered over the actions he needed to take next. Diablo refrained from participating directly in the conflict to offer his companions a chance for growth. With Benimaru and the others just awakening to their powers, Diablo believed that they could swiftly adapt to their new strengths only through actual combat with formidable foes. If he had joined the battle, none except Velgrind would have given him a significant challenge. Diablo understood that receiving power without utilizing it effectively to defeat foes and grow was futile, aligning with what he presumed Rimura desired. However, all these could also be excuses for Diablo to stick to his plan of staying by Rimura's side to watch the battle, which he found immensely exciting, especially witnessing the fight between Rimuru and the two true dragons. During this period on the battlefield of Dwargan Nation, the Monster Federation's forces enjoyed a brief respite due to the relocation of Velgrind, Tatsuya Kandu, and other Imperial Guardians. Subsequent reinforcements sent by Melim, including the Beast King Karian and the Sky Queen Frey, tipped the combat balance heavily in their favor. Significantly, with the birth of Mana's Seal, Gabru received Seal's ultimate gifts, Lord of Psychology and the former empire's great mage Gadra transformed into a new race, a metal demon. Thus, no one could halt the advance of the Monster Federation's army, leading to the annihilation of the empire's last legion, the Magic Beast Division. 
Following the news of Remura's victory over Velgrind, the morale of the Monster Federation's army surged, prompting all non-disabled soldiers to launch an assault on the airships. Left behind were only Laplace and Vega. Their aim was not to assist Remura but to rescue Yuki and Kigali, who were under Emperor Rudra's control, along with Kigali's jesters, Footman and Tia. On their side, the forbidden spell Mystic Dead production cast by Kigali with Velgrind's assistance had already concluded. The exact number of death men born from it was unknown, so it was imperative to find and restrain them before their awakening. However, upon reaching his destination, Laplace's subsequent actions were interrupted by the appearance of a man. Dressed in a bright red military uniform, the elegant gentleman did not seem very strong. His face resembled a crafted doll's, making it difficult to discern his gender. Recognizing Laplace, he indicated that a confrontation was inevitable. However, Laplace did not recognize the individual, who introduced himself as Feldway and ranked tenth in the Imperial Guardians, also known as the pillars supporting the Empire's history. Feldway, positioned at number ten, was ready to fill any vacancies in the single digits thus playing a crucial role in the Empire's legacy. Laplace, familiar with the name, remarked that Feldway was known as the Reserve Man. Feldway corrected him, stating he was either male nor female. Laplace remained on guard, conversing while assessing Feldway's form. Feldway showed no stance for combat nor intention to flee, puzzling Laplace about his true motives. Meanwhile, Vega, growing impatient, declared Feldway inconsequential to him. Laplace quickly intervened, cautioning that rash actions could jeopardize their hostages, including Yuki and Kigali. Just as Laplace sought to further assess the situation, Yuki Kagurazaka unexpectedly appeared, disrupting the standoff. Yuki accused Laplace of betrayal and urged Vega to join him in eliminating Laplace. Without hesitation, Vega switched sides, asking to devour Laplace upon their victory. Vega, embodying power within Cerberus, possessed the innate unique skill, Scavenger, allowing him to gain strength by consuming his enemies. Earlier, Vega had devoured numerous soldiers from the Empire's Magic Beast Division and even acquired a mythic-level Azure Dragon Spear, significantly boosting his power. Vega was a monster who thrived on instinctively devouring foes. Yuki was indifferent to the means as long as it strengthened Vega. Meanwhile, sensing imminent danger, Laplace decided to flee, recognizing it as his only viable option. Laplace immediately attempted to cast a teleportation spell, but it was too late. Felway, observing from the sidelines, exerted spatial dominance over the surrounding area, disrupting Laplace's spellcasting. Subsequently, Yuki and Vega encircled Laplace, cutting off any chance of escape. Faced with a seemingly hopeless situation, Laplace refused to give in. Betting on the slim possibility that Yuki could be freed from the Emperor's mental control, Laplace tapped into his hidden strength. In a moment of opportunity, he unleashed a kick, sending the overzealous Vega flying. The power disparity was so vast that Vega was propelled several meters away, unable to rise again. Yuki couldn't help but commend Laplace's formidable strength, but promptly declared he would personally deal with Laplace. However, Laplace sensed something off noting a stark difference in Yuki's manner of speaking. The tone and terminology Yuki used were significantly altered, prompting Laplace to fall into contemplation. Meanwhile, Yuki took advantage of this chance to attack. Realizing his oversight, Laplace braced for death, screaming internally before closing his eyes in resignation. Yet, after a brief moment, no pain came. Instead, an unexpected figure appeared blocking Yuki's punch. The magical intervention came from Diablo, who muttered about being scolded by Rimura-sama. Overjoyed, Laplace inquired if Diablo had come to his rescue. Initially puzzled, Diablo quickly caught on, affirming he was indeed there to save Laplace, and insisted Laplace emphasize Diablo's role in the rescue when reporting back to Rimura-sama. For reasons unknown, Diablo flashed a brilliant smile. Despite feeling skeptical, Laplace, in his current predicament, had no choice but to trust Diablo and assured he would convey the message to Rimuru. Diablo then readied himself for battle. In fact, after Rimuru had devoured Velgrind, 
he noticed Diablo spectating nearby and questioned why he was there instead of working. Diablo, caught off guard, hastily claimed he was guarding the area to prevent anyone from interfering with Rimurasama. However, through Seal's analysis, it was deduced that Diablo's motive for staying was merely to slack off. Consequently, Rimuru, somewhat irritated, instructed Diablo to join the others in battle. Although Diablo had a duty to protect Rimuru, he was shirking his responsibilities, leading to a sorrowful glance at Rimuru before he teleported away. His arrival at Dwargan Nation was not out of a desire to assist Laplace but merely to comply with orders. Diablo decided to spare Yuki for the time being, given Yuki's status as Rimura-sama's ally, and shifted his attention to another individual dressed in a red military uniform, realizing he was Spectre Lord Feldway. Diablo immediately understood Feldway's alliance with Rudra for the invasion of the Central World. Feldway, who had maintained a smiling facade until Diablo's arrival, now sported a demonic expression, expressing surprise that Primordial Black had chosen to serve Demon Lord Rimuru. Diablo, introducing himself with the splendid name given by Rimuru-sama, declared Feldway's schemes irrelevant to him. However, he made it clear that any attempt by Feldway to hinder Rimuru-sama would be met with no mercy. Feldway accused Diablo of shamelessness as ever. Clearly, Diablo's demon race had always hindered Feldway's kind. He glared at Diablo with intense hatred, his body radiating a murderous aura. However, Diablo remained unfazed, provocatively maintaining his composure and making it clear that even in a battle with Feldway right there, his chances of winning were non-existent. Felway conceded he couldn't defeat Diablo either. As they glared at each other, Felway stated he would withdraw for the moment, but warned Diablo against interference next time, promising no mercy. Diablo, not to be outdone, acknowledged Feldway's remembrance of his name and agreed to step back while preparing to eliminate Feldway if necessary next time. Following this tense standoff, both acted as if in agreement, disregarding each other and proceeding with their respective plans. Feldway used spatial teleportation to send Yuki, Kigali, Vega, Footman, Tia, and a group of newly born death men back to Emperor Rudra's airship, while Diablo, believing his mission there was accomplished and recognizing Spectre Lord Feldway as the enemy, decided to follow to Emperor Rudra's airship to continue his efforts. Thus, the stage was set on the airship with various formidable figures gathering, and Rimura began addressing the matter with Scorched Dragon Velgrind setting the scene for the final battle. At last, let's add a bit more about the battle between Marco and Veron. Interestingly, both of their skills revolve around mimicking the abilities of others through their unique skills. Marco utilized his unique skill, Adapter, to imitate his idol Tatsuya Kanda. Coupled with Emperor Rudra's ultimate enchantment, Marco achieved 80% of Tatsuya Kanda's strength. Under such circumstances, Veron stood no chance. However, at a critical moment, Veyron aspired to mimic someone even more formidable, Rimura-sama himself. That was when Seal intervened, stating that mimicking Rimura-sama was not allowed but directly bestowed upon Veyron the ultimate gift, artist, thereby turning the tide of the battle. The naming here is quite intriguing, implying that the original work of an artist always surpasses any imitation. Alright, that's all for this video. In the next episode, we will shift our focus back to Rimuru, observing how Rimuru and Seal assisted Velgrind in her rebirth. Additionally, the Lord of Justice revealed his true nature as Rimuru successfully repelled the Lord of Justice, Manus Michael, and Feldway. And finally, Velgrind embarked on a journey to find Rudra. The upcoming story is thrilling, featuring Velgrind's growing suspicion of Rimura's true identity and Manus Michael's direct annihilation of Velgrind's parallel existence. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Your support is greatly appreciated. See you in the next one.